For reaction, I'm joined now by Richard Fowler, an old friend, host of The Richard Fowler Show, a progressive messaging expert. We'll also get Richard's take on Donald Trump's so-called outreach to the African-American voter. Richard joins me from Washington. Amy Kremer, who's a big supporter of Donald Trump, uh, founder of the Tea Party movement, says that, uh, just said that uh, Trump is behind with women, but he gets a bad press, she gets a good press, he'll pick it up, she'll, he'll pick it up in the next two months, and there's a hidden vote for him, people who don't want to say they're voting for him, but who will. What do you make of that? Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true, Larry. I think what the polls say is that Donald Trump is extremely, extremely unpopular. I'm not saying that Hillary Clinton isn't unpopular, but Donald Trump is extremely unpopular, and his outreach that he's trying to make to the American electorate just seems to be a little bit off. What the American people are looking for now more so than ever is how do they level the playing field? How do they close the, the achievement gap that exists? How do they close the wage gap? Uh, and Donald Trump hasn't addressed any of these things. He says he's going to create jobs. He doesn't tell you how. He says he's going to fix immigration. He doesn't tell you how. Um, building a wall and deporting 11 million Americans is not how you fix our immigration problem. So I think what the, Donald, what the Trump campaign has got to do very soon is they have to come up with a, a, a succinct message for the American people, and they've got to stick to that message. Uh, they've had a couple of good weeks, thanks to their new campaign manager who's done a yeoman's work in really turning this campaign around. But does that get away from all the bad mistakes and the miss that this campaign has made months before? I don't think it does. Trump, uh, is, according to polls, is getting about 8% of the black vote. He's recently said to blacks, look at your conditions in the inner cities. All those inner cities have Democratic mayors. Why not give another person a chance? That has not resonated. Why not? Here's why it hasn't resonated, Larry, because just because you have a Democratic mayor um, or a Democratic city council doesn't necessarily mean you aren't affected by really, really bad Republican policies. I'll give you a great example. Detroit, Michigan, right, a, a city that's supposed to be on the verge of a comeback, but their public school system are stuck. Uh, in neutral because the governor took that school system over. This is the same governor, as you can remember, Larry, who took over the water system in Flint and poisoned, willingly poisoned the people of Flint, Michigan. Right? So Republican policies have trickled down to democratically ran cities, and the impacts are are astounding. I mean, take, take Chicago, another city that, yes, it's run by Democrats, right? But at the same time, it has a proliferation of illegal guns on its streets. Why? Because Republicans are bought and sold by the National Rifle Association, and they refuse to end straw purchasing. They refuse to end the gun show loophole. So these illegal guns are allowed to get onto the streets of Chicago and kill innocent people like Dwayne Wade's cousin this past weekend. So, yes, there are rep democratically run cities, but there are Republicans in legislatures, there are Repub there's a Republican Congress, and there's a lot of times Republican governors that stand in the way of progress. All right. Um, both sides are calling each side a bigot. Do you believe either one of these candidates is bigoted? That's a, th I hate when people throw around the word bigotry, right? Because bigotry takes on so many meanings on so, diff on so many different levels, right? So to some extent, the, the, the Trump campaign uh, it does reek of bigotry how he may, how he treats his, how he talks about people of color whether it be Latinos whether it be African Americans whether it be you know all of his dog whistle politics right where he's talking about African Americans and how to fix the African American community yet there's not one African American in the audience he refuses to have a conversation with the African American community on how to make it better then on the other hand I'm a I'm a staunch Democrat but I will say there's times where the Democratic Party takes the African American vote for granted. Because the African American vote isn't monolithic, right? We don't all vote the same way or think the same thing or, or, or you know, eat the same food, right? We are unique people and we have, we have, we vote on different issues and we have a variant of issues. Because here's the, the, the most important thing that folks at home need to understand is, is that issues that affect the African American community are also issues that affect everyday Americans, right? So an African American issue is an American issue. Uh, and that's the mistake that I think all the campaigns are making the, uh, during this election cycle. If you want to talk to the African American community, then let's talk about the issues that are affecting them, the same issues that are affecting everyday Americans. We're talking about the, uh, the fact that people have a hard time getting home ownership. We're talking about the ridiculous
ridiculous amount of student loan debt that people have taken on to achieve the American dream. We're talking about the, the, the disbalance that exists in our police departments all across this country where African Americans are disproportionately stopped, right? Those are issues that affect everyday Americans because a good working police force not only helps white people, but they help black people and Latino people, right? And, a, and Asian Pacific Islanders. So you got to look at, you can't look at issues in a vacuum. What the Trump campaign is trying to do is look at quote unquote black issues in a vacuum. And that has never worked, nor will it work to get him, garner him African-American votes. Something puzzled me, Richard, maybe you can help me. The, sure, the, the quarterback absolutely. of the San Francisco 49ers won't stand during the national anthem because he can't salute a country who has dealt his race and other minority races so poorly. Why, in the year 2016, should race be any kind of an issue? Why, why do people care about someone's color in the year 2016? Why? Larry, that is a good question I think we're all trying to answer. And I think that's what the Black Lives Matter movement is trying to ask, answer. answer. It's a question. Do black lives really matter? And, and I think that is what is so troubling, which is why this quarterback has chosen to, you know, in his protest, say, America, we're dealing with the same issues we're dealing with 60 years ago. 60 years after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, our schools are more segregated now than they were then. Larry, I mean, think about it. The, 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 the poverty gap that exists between the, the, uh, the white community and the African-American community, the lack of jobs, and the we lack know of that. resources. The question is and so why? All those, things, all those things have created a situation where oppression and racism are rampant. Right, which is why we're still dealing with this. Why the color of somebody's skin still matters over the content of their character is that in this era that we live in, thanks to the alt right and thanks to some far right extremists and thanks to policies pushed by the far right extremists, you have the you you see this play it you see it you see this racism rare its, rare its ugly head. Right, you see it rare its ugly head in Baltimore, where a young man was stared at the police officer, and because he said a police officer, he was killed. Or you saw it take place in in, in Minnesota where Alton Sterling, somebody who had a concealed carry permit, was shot for living out his Second Amendment right. So the, this question of racism and race has plagued this country. It's compounded years, 400 years of compounded racism got us to this point. And the only way, Larry, we're going to deal with that is by asking the question that you're asking. Why are we still dealing with this in 2016? And having honest conversations about how we fix it, which is more than just policy solutions. Yes, we've got to fix the allocation of resources and policies, but we've also really got to work on changing the hearts and minds of Americans. Richard, from your lips to God, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Larry.